Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and we'd like to, again, welcome everyone back for our first show of the season. And we're looking forward to a great, great series of discussions on uh, topics in civil society. So today, we're going to be talking about the state of women he women's health in America following the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision that overturned the 49-year Roe versus Wade precedent, uh, allowing some abortions. Our special guests today are Dr. Teresa Rohr Kirschgraber, president of the American Medical Women's Association, and Melissa Reed, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Keystone in Pennsylvania. Thank you both for being here. This is such an important and important topic. I'd like to uh, sort of set this up. I'm going to go to you, uh, Teresa. Prior to June 24th, June 24th, only two months uh, hence, uh, 2022, there was the Dobbs decision. And before that, the Roe versus Wade ruling meant that government authorities couldn't prohibit a woman from having abortions as long as they happen within a certain time frame. And today, government authorities can actually require a woman to carry a pregnancy until birth or some other outcome. So the, as a result, there are a lot of different laws that are now being promulgated in the states. There's a lot of confusion. Now, change is inevitable, right? Whenever there's a large decision, there will be change. So uh, wringing one's hands about the fact that change does happen seems to be counterproductive. I think we'd like to get into the details of what this change actually means for women who would like to access a type of health care. Uh, Teresa, could you just lay out what the impact of this change is, the practical impact on individuals throughout the country? Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much. You know, one of the things I'd like to kind of just throw out there, even, even to start out, is the unintended consequences. It's true that whenever change happens, there's the thought that it's only going to do that one thing that one piece of change, but in actuality, it affects so many more things. So, you know, so for example, let's just start with the fact that as family planning clinics close because they're no longer able to do their job, do the work that they had start, started out to do, one of the unintended consequences is going to be the decrease in screening for breast and gynecological cancers because so many of our family planning clinics, Planned Parenthood included, actually help to provide those services for thousands upon thousands of women. So not only are you not able to access abortion services for which abortion is healthcare, you're also decreasing the ability to access those screening services. Also, let's include the fact that those family planning clinics were not just providing termination, they were also providing contraception. So being able to not get pregnant in the first place, when we decrease the accessibility to family planning clinics, you actually impact much more so than just the ability for terminations. So let's, let, let's take this on because you talk about the fact that family planning clinics um, are closing. And there are some some unanticipated consequences of this is what you're basically saying is that abortion services, it's not cut and dry. It's not as if you either get an abortion or you don't get an abortion. There are care that there is care that can be given that could be interpreted as an abortion and therefore in certain states now illegal. That is not necessarily about terminating a um, a fetus and more about the fact that that a woman's health might require such a service. Is that is, is that what's going on here is that some of these clinics are are going away because there's so much ambiguity of where lines are that they can no longer absorb uh, any legal risk. Is that what's I think that's part of it. You know, Melissa, you might want to answer this too, but let me just let me just paint a scenario. If you are a young woman, and I utilized Planned Parenthood when I was in, in college, if you're a young woman and you need to get contraceptive care, you know where to go, you'll look it up online, you end up going to your Planned Parenthood. But imagine that you're that 
18, 19 year old who has to walk by people yelling and screaming at you saying you're killing, you know, whatever. And it's like, I, I wasn't doing that. I just going to get some birth control and maybe get my pap smear done. And then I got, you know, people yelling and screaming at me. And, you know, when, when what those clinics did was the, the abortion was a, a very small component. So I'm trying to go to be proactive and get contraception and I'm being thwarted at the very get go. I mean, that that is really going to impact my ability as a young person. Well, when I was a young person to be able to access that that kind of care and force me into, you know, perhaps other more unsafe types of procedures or, you know, um, accessibility. Melissa, you, do you want to weigh in here? Are you are you finding the same kind of impediments? Well, I can say that in Pennsylvania, we don't have as many, but but I think Dr. Orr's right. Like, let's look at Texas as an example. Already, those Planned Parenthood facilities are not allowed to participate in Medicaid. They do not have 340B discounted contraceptive counseling. So she's absolutely right that the continuum of reproductive health care is at risk for all women and it is not just abortion. And the impacts are severe, so not just the ones that she mentioned, but also what we know is there's a significant economic impact to women and their families when they're not able to control their reproductive lives. That, you know, that has been intrinsically linked to women's ability to further participate in the marketplace and to in education. There's also an extreme impact in maternal and infant mortality when women cannot space their pregnancies, when they don't have adequate um, resources available for them. And so uh, the risks are far reaching. And I think that people who oppose women's ability to make those decisions without interference don't, are very myopic in their thinking and don't realize the significant harms. Let me ask you something about this idea of one person telling another person what they can and cannot do in this area. Um, I'm a guy, I'm never going to get pregnant. So do I actually, should I be able to actually make a decision on this? Should I, is this one of those situations where my ability to make a decision might actually, um, I, I shouldn't necessarily impose my decision on you. If I have a different faith than you do, and a slightly different view of when conception uh, occurs, do I get to tell you what my view is and then force you to adhere to it? Uh, what do you think about about that? I'm not talking about the the issue of abortion, but I'm sure that you have your individual beliefs, uh, you know, separate from your medical work and so on. How do we we function in this civil society? Because uh, this whole idea that one group gets to impose their will on another group, whether it's men on women or people who are of a particular view, um, to what extent should this highly personal decision? be one that that other people get to affect for ourselves. Teresa, what do you think? Well, you know, I'll comment on this because this gets kind of to the heart of the physician patient relationship. No matter how many other family members are involved, how, at the end of the day, the decision rests between the physician and the patient. And many times when I have another person in the room, I ask that person to leave so that I can have a direct conversation with the patient. The patient is my patient, not everybody else. Of course, it's always um, in, in encouraged to have others with you to, to make sure that that patient is not alone. But at, they're the ones that really have to go through the process, whether that is chemotherapy, radiation for their cancer, or whether carrying a pregnancy, it's their decision because it's going to affect their body and their capacity to deal with their family and community. So, so if I have cancer and I'm also pregnant and I'm and I'm weighing the harm of these different these different aspects, um, Melissa, can I can I walk into any Planned Parenthood or not a Planned Parenthood? Could I be talking with my oncologist and the oncologist says? 
you should do the medically correct thing, or these are the medical choices. Do I actually get to have that conversation, um, uh, Melissa? And and then Teresa, if you could wear uh, weigh in, um, how how does that work? Well, at Planned Parenthood, certainly, whenever a patient comes in and is trying to make a decision about their pregnancy or about their health in general. As licensed providers and clinicians and people who care deeply about providing non-judgmental care, we lay out all the options. There's the options. There's the risks and benefits of all those different options. And then let the patient decide what's best for them. I mean, as, as Dr. Orr mentioned, other people being involved in that decision can be helpful as a support system. But fundamentally, if I have a different viewpoint about what should happen, I'm not in that individual's shoes, right? I can't possibly know what their situation is. And so it's not appropriate for me to involve myself in someone other's deeply personal medical decision making. So I wouldn't just. Yeah. I'm in South Car- Car- uh, Carolina, where that uh, th- that uh, law was just uh, passed to uh, to basically ban um, all abortions, as far as I understand it. There were there were a couple of exceptions. Uh, can I have that conversation? Is that between me and my doctor? Or is it between me, and my doctor, and the uh, and the government of South Carolina? Unfortunately, sixty four hundred women who are pregnant will get cancer every year, 6,400. So these are young women who are pregnant who now develop a cancer. In some states, your physician will not even be able to talk to you about the potential um, options of a termination of that pregnancy so that you can start the life-saving treatment. In some cases, I as a physician will get prosecuted for even bringing it up. Okay. So I, I will have to, in the exam room with you, who has now, you're pregnant and you have a, a cancer, I can't even offer you some of the chemotherapeutic agents you could use to save your life because it could also cause a termination of that pregnancy. So if I'm in the early stages of pregnancy and, and um, I, have, I cannot get a, a life-saving treatment, um, and still sustain the pregnancy. I'm basically required by the government to sustain the pregnancy rather right. than getting the life saving. At the cost of your life. Hmm. Yes, right. you are. And, and I was going to say, Dr. Ward, m- most of the people who get an abortion are already parents. And so not only are they saying you have to risk your life, but you may no longer be able to be around healthy or even alive to care for your existing children. So if most of the people who are requesting abortions already have children, um, what does that also say? Does that say, is that basically saying is that, um, that parents are forced to have as many children as they possibly uh, can have? If they become pregnant, they actually have to bring every child to term. Um, and then who takes care of, uh, of, of these children? What kind of, of response has there been on the heels of Roe versus Wade in terms of improving uh, health of these larger families? Um, have, you, have you seen anything in that, in that uh, line, Melissa? Um, or are, are, is it basically have the baby and now you're on your own? Sadly, in the United States, it's basically have the baby and you're on your own. We don't have um, a good parental leave program for companies in this country. We don't have good child care. We don't even have good access to health care. And in the states where bans are already in effect, the majority of people impacted are going to be those who are already living in poverty. They are going to be people who... Um, are black and brown. They are gonna be the people who are already marginalized and they are gonna suffer the the most as they have throughout history in the United States. It's It's unconscionable. And women are moral decision makers, right? When it's, when you hear that many of the people making a decision about abortion are already parents, those are people who know what it's like to have a full term pregnancy who know the cost and commitment and care it requires to raise a child 
and are making a responsible moral decision to limit the size of their family. So to what extent is this, uh, are these series of laws a matter of social control in that you, you basically identify people who are the deciders and you identify another group of people who have to follow, right? In other words, since abortion is not going to affect me personally, I'm an older uh, male, I cannot get pregnant and my, my wife and I are, are done having children, right? I'm now going to make decisions for people who could get pregnant, right? Is, is it, it, just, it just seems to me that, that this idea that, that there are people who are deciders and there are people who are younger, perhaps don't vote or not very involved in the political process, who are women who could get pregnant and so on of different religions. Uh, it just seems like it's, it, it's a way of, of imposing decisions on, on a whole segment of society. It's a way of me <laughs> exercising power, isn't it, Teresa? So I'm laughing because uh, this is kind of why AMWA first got together back in 1915. Surprise, the world isn't equitable. <laughs> um, we've kind of known this for quite some time and it continues to be a problem. And, it, and it's why there are st there's still a need for, for groups like the American Medical Women's Association. We have to be involved. We have to be proactive. We have to be out there talking about this and trying to raise awareness, you know, and help to make the change that's needed. You're, you're right. I mean, there are folks making decisions, you know, and it's, it's very interesting, I think, because when you actually put the decision in front of the people, i.e. Kansas, they voted to be able to include abortion as health care. When you put the decision before legislatures who are technically elected officials, but, but elected in a very gerrymandered way, who are very con concerned about their next election, that is not by the people. If you really want to know what we think, put it to a vote for all of us and let us bring it up every year. We could vote again. But I mean, the, the fact that, and Melissa stated it so eloquently, this is not about taking care of the kids after they're born. You know, I'm currently in the state of Georgia and the state of Georgia is one of the highest rates of infant and maternal mortality. This is women dying during pregnancy and their children dying. I mean, this is this is not, you know, atypical, you know, unfortunately, it's been happening here for so many years. It's one of the statistics, one of the places we don't want to be number one. So let's let, let's talk about that. Can we talk about the comparative risk, the comparative medical risk of, of, uh, of bringing a pregnancy fully to term? And, a, and the risks that are associated with the actual abortion procedures. Could you, as a medical doctor, Teresa, just describe the comparative risks? Oh, we goodness. About in, terms of, in terms of health? Because um, we've, we've heard about uh, all this different information and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to navigate, all right? It, it, if you just take a look at, at the medical process of gestating a child through to, through to birth, um, and you look at the medical process of deciding to uh, get an abortion, what is the comparative risk for a woman's health? Oh, it's so, so significantly different. I mean, so let's talk just, just briefly about a medical termination. So a medical abortion, this is usually done before 20 weeks of gestation. So um, it's a use of two different medications, one that helps to stop progesterone so that the the blood supply to that placenta to that growing that growing fetus just stops and then the other that kind of helps to loosen up the cervix so that that the the cervix kind of opens up so that products of conception can get taken out or just pushed out so it's not surgical it's not even a procedure it's a couple of pills you do one pill one day, you take the next four the next day, and then you pass the things on your own. That's it. There is almost no risk at all to having that medical um, uh, termination. So, but so in that, and then there and then there are other procedures that carry greater risk, right? 
Right. Well, greater risks, but the, any surgical procedures are always a risk of uh, anesthesia in and of itself, even if you don't do a procedure, has a, has a, a risk of about 0.4% or 0.04%. So very small, but still, yes. Um, the risk of bleeding with dilation and keratage, if you have to go in and, and surgically remove, you know, do a scraping to take out the, the products of conception. And the further along you are, the harder it is. And that's true. But, but let's Let's think very carefully about this when I say the further along you are, because abortions that occur during the second trimester are usually not done because oh, I just don't want this kid anymore. There's usually some medical complication that is putting that mother at risk. Um, either it's a child that the, the child is not going to be survivable. They have anencephaly or other major deformities that's going to make the continuation of that pregnancy very complicated. There's also um, pre eclampsia or preeclampsia, so medical conditions that have caused the, the mother to become acutely potentially ill, that if we don't get rid of the, the, the fetus that's causing it, it's going to cause the death of the mother. You know, all of those things. So most of the time, you know, a, a second trimester or a late term abortion, it's not a simple thing and it's not done without a lot of discussion and angst and, you know, evaluation. Our point there is that in those kinds of cases, very often a medical procedure is required anyway. Right. right? And, and so in those particular cases, since a medical procedure is is required anyway, and since now in certain states such a medical procedure might be viewed as abortion, and therefore uh, could be prohibited, you're actually placing the health of a woman in greater danger. Right. Uh, this regimen, uh, Melissa, uh, same question to you in terms of of how this this uh, could impact uh, women in general. Um, in terms of what you're seeing, are you seeing a, a flood of people coming in from neighboring states or from, from other parts of the country to, uh, to your Planned Parenthood? So Planned Parenthood Keystone is located in Pennsylvania. And what we can expect is that we will see an additional 8,500 patients seeking an abortion in Pennsylvania over the next year as states continue to ban the procedure. There's, I believe at the time of this discussion, 16 states have bans in place, whether it's a total ban or six week ban or, or some such. As we have seen double the amount of patients coming from out of state already, the majority right now, yeah, double. The majority right now are from Ohio. West Virginia still has um, abortion legal in their state, although um, sadly, I don't think that will last very long. So more people from West Virginia. But what may surprise you, Mark, is we're also seeing a higher number of patients coming from states like Maryland and New Jersey, where it's still very much legal to have an abortion, but their appointments are filling up from out of state people coming to them. And so their state residents are coming into Pennsylvania. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So do you think that, that the, the, this change is now going to cause for people with the means to migrate? In other words, a lot of traveling in order to get the medical procedures that they need. And it could also be people who need to have medical procedures that could look like abortions that are now no longer uh, available in their state. Um, are we also going to start seeing uh, medical colleges starting to concentrate in those areas where the laws are, are, are more um, conducive to a, a, a more well-rounded uh, view of, of how uh, medical treatment should function, Melissa. Um, how, how are you seeing this? Well, we already are seeing many um, corporations and businesses standing with their employees and saying, we're going to help you uh, get the care you need. We'll either pay for it, or if you need to relocate, we're going to cover the cost of that. We have seen companies say that they're no longer going to have headquarters in states where there are bans. And as far as medical colleges and universities, there will be a chilling effect because state legislatures are already saying they are going to withhold 
state dollars from those universities if they train their uh, medical students and residents in the performance of abortion. And what that means then is we are going to have ob guys and others without the knowledge they may need um, in situations where a patient has miscarried or where they might have an ectopic pregnancy in order to provide very necessary care. It seems like we're going a little bit backwards. Um, uh, Teresa, do you have a particular position of the, uh, from the American Medical Women's Association about the education? Oh, absolutely. And we have a couple of position papers on our website about it. And and just this summer, we had three of our medical students write a very poignant letter to the editor about the fact that they are from a state in which these the six week span has gone into effect. They want to stay in this state. They want to practice here. But they're rethinking their ideas because they can't get the proper training in order to just to do a, um, a termination for an acute emergency. For example, it's the same kind of training that you would get if you did an abortion. So we're going to have residents and, and physicians who have no idea what to do. And and that's just going to further implement, you know, in, in uh, make things worse. And so these three medical students, they wrote a very great letter to the editor about the fact that this was a direct impact on their training. This was a direct impact on where they would choose to practice. And so in the state of Georgia, for example, where we already have counties with more Waffle Houses than we have hospitals, we're going to just worsen that by in worsening the physician shortage. Yeah, no, I think that the citizens of our states, they deserve better than that. So if you have a, a situation where your medical health um, is, it's, it's required that you have access to certain types of treatment, you might actually decide that you don't wanna locate your family in that particular area uh, simply because of uh, the quality of, of medical care. One of the things that, that we've just done is we, we've done uh, three polls and we're going to collect uh, right after I sort of give you a summary of, of those polls into a uh, discussion of solutions. But the first poll was, uh, which factor do you feel was most important in the Supreme Court's uh, recent decision? And it was very interesting. Legal philosophy got 30, 38%, uh, but we got political affiliation, 25%, and religious and personal beliefs, also 25%. So between political affiliations and uh, religious and personal beliefs, um, those two areas basically made up 50% of the respondents to the poll. Uh, which I think is very interesting because uh, judges should not theoretically be making um, decisions for American civil society based on their religious beliefs or their political affiliation. Right. The second uh, uh, piece, does the Dobbs uh, decision overturning Roe help or harm health? And 13% um, said it actually improves health, the, the Dobbs decision, and 88% said that overturning Roe uh, harms health. And the final uh, question was about who decides, who decides what the law should be on abortion. And nobody chose the courts. Nobody. Um, we had 29% of people uh, saying voters and 71% said each person should decide on themselves, uh, uh, for themselves. So let me ask you a question about how we go forward, because right now the Dobbs decision has fallen. It's not going to be overturned. We are going to have a patchwork of laws here in this country. So, uh, Melissa, let's start with you, and then Teresa will give you the last word. Melissa, how do we go forward? You're going to continue at Planned Parenthood to provide your services, but on a national basis, that's going to become increasingly challenging, right? There are going to be laws that restrict uh, access. There are going to be funding challenges and other challenges? How do we move forward and how do we make it better? You're right, Mark. This is going to be a generational fight. The court used to be our backstop, right? That's where we could go because we had almost 50 years of precedent with Roe that had been affirmed over time and we can't depend on the courts anymore. And so what we are going to have to do is the fights are at the state and we are going to have to make sure that we are activated no one can any longer be on the sidelines. It is vital that every person 
makes their voice heard, that they contact their elected officials and tell them that they support the right to abortion. It's important that they take action. It's important that our federal government, the Congress steps in and passes a federal law guaranteeing the right for abortion for every citizen in the United States. A patchwork of of laws across different states, mostly, right, it'll be on the Northeast and West Coast, is unacceptable. People deserve bodily autonomy and the right to make these decisions without government intrusion. Oh, Melissa, you say it so well. (laughs) And I 110% agree. Um, it, AMWA has focused for, for years on increasing that ability for a person to make their own decision about their health care, whether that be because they have access to health insurance, access to physicians, um, all of those things kind of taken into effect. The other kind of interesting little tidbit that we're currently working on as well is that it would be nice if we could get the ERA published. It was already ratified. Perhaps it, if it had actually been published, this decision by overturning Roe v. Wade wouldn't have even been able to happen. So there are so many different ways that we can go about this, but I agree with you, Melissa, we can't stand by on the sidelines, whether or not your person who will ever have to make this choice, whether because you're a healthcare clinician or because you're a person or you have a daughter or a family member, that's kind of beside the point. We need to improve things for all families, uh, from all colors, from all socioeconomical status so that they can be successful. Remember your team wins when the weakest person on the team has all the ability and all of the accoutrements to be able to, you know, to make it work. So we are only as strongest as our, as our weakest players. So let's make, let's make everybody have opportunities so that they can be, become strong, successful, you know, prepared individuals They'll protect us in the future. They'll take care of us in the future. And I, I'd like to just have um, a, a last word here. There are, there are times when restraint is called for. And what I mean by that is that if, if, if I am going to make a decision, it should be about something that affects me personally, right? If I'm going to make a decision for you, I have to really think very, very carefully about whether I should restrain myself. I'm go, uh, my decision about you constrains you. It brings no benefit to me other than an expression of power. So if you are a woman, if you are uh, someone who could get pregnant, allow those decisions to be made by those people whom it affects, as opposed to having people that it doesn't affect, somebody like me, make a decision for you. I mean, that just seems to be to be uh, to me to be uh, considerate. If we're going to use government to restrict, that has to be done very carefully. I'd like to thank you both for helping us on uh, on this topic. It's a very complicated one. Dr. Teresa Rohr-Kiergreiber, uh, Ro- uh, President of the American uh, Medical Women's Association, and Melissa Reed, President and CEO, a Planned Parenthood Keystone, please, please, please thank your boards, thank your constituents, thank your staffs, thank your funders. Uh, keep doing your great work. And let's keep keep uh, bringing these topics up. Very, very important topics. Thank you. Thank you.